Awesome. Okay. Um, welcome everybody um, to the popular music book in popular music books and process series. All events um, are scheduled for Mondays at 5 p.m. Eastern time. This um, this session, email fvoister at depaul.edu to be added to the series email list and get Zoom links. You can watch the video of all the presentations on Eric Weisbar's YouTube channel soon after the event happens. You can find the whole calendar for the series on IASPM US website under the journal tab. The series is co-organized by Kimberly Matt, Francesca Royster, Gus Stadler, Carl Wilson, with me sitting in for Eric Weisbar this year. I am Antonia Randolph. Eric will join us often, often as he can, um, given the time difference overseas where he's doing a fellowship. The series is sponsored by the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPM US, and the Pop Conference. Um, next week, we'll have we will have on March 25th, Darren Mueller, Mueller talking with Nate Sloan about Mueller's at the at the vanguard of vinyl, a cultural history of the long playing record and jazz. But today we have Mark Masters, Jerry Pranitz, Rob Drew um, with Tom McCourt on cassettes. So Mark Masters is the author of High Bias, the distorted history of the cassette tape um, from University of California Press in 2023. Um, Mark Masters is a writer whose work has appeared in Pitchfork, The Wired, Bandcamp Daily, The Washington Post, NPR Music, and more. His first book, No Wave, was published in 2008. His second, High Bias, The Distorted History of his, the Cassette Tape, was released in UNC Press in October 2023. Uh, Jerry Kranitz, author of Cassette Culture, Homemade Music, and the Dramatic Pause, and The Creative Spirit in the Pre-Internet Pre-internet age um, from vinyl on demand and published in 2020. Jerry is the author of the cassette culture, homemade music, and the creative spirit in the pre-internet pre-internet age. For 18 years, he published the webzine Oral Innovations, the global source for space rock exploration, and the accompanying podcast Oral Innovations Space Rock Radio. Jerry has written for Shindig Magazine, and his essays have accompanied archival reissues of such artists as F.I. and Jeff Carney. Rob Drew offered up Unspooled, How the Cassette Made Music Shareable from Duke University Press 2024. Rob Drew is a professor of communication at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan. This scholarship on music, technology, and everyday life has appeared in popular music and society, popular communication, rock music studies, Cultural Studies, Critical Methodologies, and the Journal of Contemporary Ethnography. He's the, he's the author of Karaoke Nights, an ethnography of Rhapsody, Altamira, 2001, and Unspooled. And then Tom McCourt, our moderator. Tom is a retired professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. He's the author of Conflicting Communication Interests in America, The Case of National Public Radio, from Bloomsbury, Bloomsbury in, in 1999, and co-author of Digital Music Wars, Ownership and Control of, of the Celestial Jukebox from Rowan and Littlefield in 2006, and Why Hackers Win, Power and Disruption in the Network Society from University of California Press in 2019. A couple of housekeeping notes, place your questions or comments in the chat, and Carl will lead the Q&A after the conversation. Uh, where he will ask you to unmute. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to our presenters. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you all for uh, joining us today. And uh, I guess let's start at the very beginning. I'm curious uh, how uh, Jerry, Mark, and Rob uh, got their interests in uh, cassettes from the outset. Tom, can we say a few words from the? Oh, God, I was going to, go I was ahead. going to read a bit. Sorry. <laughs> no, All right, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> sorry, go ahead. We'll go. I'll go after my my esteemed colleagues, but 
Mark, I think Mark was going to go Mark, first. Mark, Mark, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. Yeah. I think we're each going to give a little, little, a few minutes of just describing right. what our books are about and what, what we did, and maybe reading a little bit from them. So, uh, so this is mine. It's called High Bias: The Distorted History of the Cassette Tape. Came out on University of North Carolina Press last October. Uh, it's, I guess, it's both the technical, technological, and cultural history of the cassette tape format, but leaning more toward the cultural side. I do talk about how, how the technology developed, but I mostly talk about how it affected. Uh, music and music communities. Um, so I'm just going to sort of give a little rundown of like the chapter structure so people have a sense of what's in the book. Um, my first chapter is the tech, mostly the technological side, how how the format developed from, you know, from the beginning of magnetic recording all the way up to uh, Phillips and Lou Otten's uh, inventing the, the format that we think of as a cassette today, which they call the compact cassette. I also kind of run through a uh, some of the technologies that developed after that around the cassette, like uh, the boombox and the Walkman and the four-track recorder, all things that uh, really affected the way people listen to and make and, and trade music pretty much uh, all the way up to now, even 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 for people who aren't using cassettes anymore, th those things affected the way they think about music. And my second chapter is about uh, genres that were boosted or even maybe even created because of cassettes. Um, go through uh, hip hop, uh, go go, indie rock, heavy metal, uh, lo-fi indie rock was sort of a, a, a tangent off of indie rock, uh, and just sort of exploring the ways that because of cassettes, these musics were able to flourish outside of conventional channels. They became a communication tool for the artists who were making them. Like say the DJs and hip hop were basically influencing each other because of um, tapes that were made at, at DJ parties and tapes that the DJs made themselves that got passed around. Uh, to the point where it, it, the, the genre, in a way, developed completely outside of mainstream music and re recorded official release music. So that's my second chapter. Uh, the third chapter is, uh, I call it Cassettes Underground, which is sort of about uh, the 80s, a little bit before and a little bit after the 80s, um, a, a sort of a worldwide network of people who made music on cassette, uh, experimental music, avant-garde music, noise music and traded it and shared it and collaborated with it and jerry uh jerry's book is completely about that and mine is sort of like a little mini version of jerry's book in a way jerry's book is great on that um i also delve into a little bit uh as a, as a kind of tangent off of that people who have used cassettes as instruments as part of their music e either um pre-recording stuff and and uh bringing cassettes and playing them as part of their uh presentation or concerts or actually using the format to make noise that wasn't on it to begin with, things like that. Uh, let's see, my fourth chapter is about, essentially about bootleg bootlegging on cassette. I call it the tape traders. It's probably about half of it is about the Grateful Dead, but then there's a lot of other stories and things about how cassettes facilitated people to um, share live live music and concerts between each other that weren't getting officially released and help these Bands develop communities around bands, help bands grow audiences without uh, officially releasing music. And uh, and also a lot of good stories in there about how the lengths that people would go to to record concerts, you know, putting cassettes in their cassette players in their pants or burying them in the bathroom the night before, or things like that. In the bathroom of the, not their own bathroom, in the bathroom of the concert thing. <laughs> um, so for my fifth chapter, I mean, and Rob can talk about this a lot too, the... Uh, Cassette made probably even more of an impact outside of Western countries than it did in the West. Um, and there are lots of great stories to be told about that. Andrew, who is here today, wrote a great book about cassette culture in Egypt. And uh, Peter Manuel wrote a great one about uh, cassette culture in India. And uh, it was way beyond my scope and ability to to get too deeply into any specific country just because I couldn't travel and <laughs> couldn't talk to too many people there. So I, I took the tack of um, approaching those subjects through people who go to those countries and dig up cassettes uh people like from labels like awesome tapes for africa sublime frequencies and sawhill sounds um and then also other people who just hunt for tapes all over the world because tapes have become sort of a living archive of music that never made it to vinyl or any other official formats it only exists that way and if the tapes disappear that music is going to disappear so there's a lot of people doing great work digging things up that way um my last my sixth chapter is about mixtapes uh, the, the sort of cultural of uh, personal mixtapes, people sharing mixtapes, making mixtapes for each other or themselves, all the different reasons from the cliches of like romantic courtship to the 
even bigger cliche maybe of, of trying to brag about the music you own and show people all the records you have by putting them all on tape. Um, and then my final chapter is about sort of the resurgence uh, of recent times of, of cassettes and all the labels that are putting out cassettes now and using Bandcamp and uh, finding it a good alternative to vinyl because it's cheaper and faster. And it's a good way to sell physical media without having to invest too much or you know, having to lose too much money. Everybody probably does lose money ultimately on it, but you lose a lot less when you make it on cassette. Um, and I do want to read a little quick excerpt from the part I was mentioning about how there are certain artists who have used cassettes as instruments. Um, one of the more interesting guys to me is this guy, Jason Zeh, which I've never actually spoken to him directly, so I'm not sure if you pronounce it Zeh, but it's Z-E-H. So here's a couple of paragraphs on him from the my book. So Jason Zeh explores the question of, as he puts it, what does cassette technology want to say and how can I help it speak for itself? Growing up, he watched his father dub records he checked out from the library using a photocopier at work to make cassette covers that match the LPs. Soon Zeb began making art for his own imaginary albums, later recording simple songs to cassette. In high school, he took a micro cassette recorder, put it inside a banjo and captured sounds from the body of the instrument, launching himself into a lifetime of tape experimentation. In college, he sometimes composed by laying different cassettes out in front of him, creating a physical score with instructions for transitions sprawled on the shelves. Over time, he prioritized the medium as an object rather than an audio container. I was dogmatically opposed to using pre-recorded sounds, he says. I wanted to push myself to use tapes in a way that was as opposite of their intended use as possible. My thinking was that tapes are a communication technology intended to convey some message. When that message is the focus, people fail to hear the essential qualities of tape. I wanted to avoid the meaning and focus on the noise that would otherwise go ignored. To achieve this goal, he continually devises new ways to use cassettes. He cuts holes in them so he can loop the tape through multiple shells. He holds tape players over open flames, producing a high-pitched sound from the melting plastic. He scratches blank tapes, adds magnets, and even removes the tape entirely, replacing it with contact mics and pieces of plastic, metal, and sandpaper. I was hoping to, dis to discover something essential and true about tape materials, he says, to make those materials speak for themselves. In an age of pristine digital audio, when it's easy to ignore the mediums that deliver music, tape is even more valuable to Zeh. If technology can fade into the background of our lives, then it's easier to ignore the growing amount of e-waste that is necessary consequence of technological advancement and planned ob obsolescence, he says. Drawing attention to and repurposing the technological trash around me is important to engaging with that reality. The only way I can think to do that is to bring to the forefront the noise produced by tape technology. Okay, so Rob, if you want to take over from me, or is it Jerry? Uh, it's Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me start with a quick backstory to how I came to write this book because I think it helps give context. In 1998, I started publishing a music zine. You know, I had reviews, articles, interviews, and I really, really liked doing interviews. I did a lot of interviews. And over time, I started to detect a trend where a lot of the people I was interviewing talked about recording their music and audio art in the 1980s on cassette tapes. And even what really got my attention was they also went on to talk about how they traded their work with other home tapers around the world. And they found each other in the music publications uh, of the time. You know, there was lots of them, but the popular ones in the U.S. were op, followed by sound choice and option. And they and they and they would collaborate, and some of them started little cottage industry labels, and they were doing all this through the postal service. No email, no electronic file sharing. This was all through the postal service. So I came to realize two things, and which form the backbone of my book. One is that the 1980s homemade music cassette cassette culture was a neglected chapter in the larger post punk story. And two, the 1980s homemade music cassette culture was yet another chapter in the story of 20th century independent arts movements, you know, like Dada, and Fluxus, and most importantly for uh, cassette culture, uh, mail art. So I, I should emphasize, uh, Mark said this, but I'll say it again. The people I focus on were recording original music and audio art on cassette tape. And throughout the 80s, a, uh, a global network of communication, 
collaboration and exchange developed. There's a powerful social history uh, dimension to this story. So I mentioned that people networked through the small press publications and zines. Contact lists got popular. It was all about people wanted to get addresses. I talked to lots of people who said they would get the new issue of Op or Sound Choice, and they would write to every single home taper who was reviewed or mentioned in an issue. Uh, and they would write them letters and they'd propose trading and sometimes friendships would develop and they'd collaborate. Um, a lot of these people were more interested. They wanted to get reviewed. I mean, most of them weren't adverse to selling their work, but most of them want to get reviewed because they wanted to grow their network. It was really common to read these reviews and there might be a, pr a price plus will trade. But it was just as common to not see a price and we'll say we'll trade. And it wasn't uncommon to see even uh, trade only. Uh, it was really interesting. So, of course, the motivation was that cassettes, unlike vinyl, cassettes were available to all. They were cheap. It was a really big deal to have a press run done of a vinyl album. But with cassettes... They didn't have any, they had no money tied up in stock. They had nothing to lose by, they could release as many cassette albums as they wanted. And some did multiple in a year. Um, and they could do them one at a time. If a trade opportunity or a sale opportunity came up, I give an account of a guy in the book who, he worked for several years in the eighties as a shipping clerk. And in his office, he had three dual well cassette decks, and he was dubbing all day long while he did his shipping clerk job. And he says that over those years, he dubbed over 3,000 cassette tapes. So was that efficient? No, of course it wasn't. But it was a means to an end. He he got done what he needed to. Um, and there were other advantages over vinyl. Um, the length of cassettes was ideal, especially for people who were doing more experimental work or ambient soundscape works, um, you know, like a 90 minute cassette, one side of the cassette was like the average length of a vinyl LP. So that was a lot of time to, to have a uninterrupted listening experience. Uh, the cassette co recorder proved to be a compositional tool. It was far more than just duplicating the sounds fed into it. You know, if they, if you did have, when you get a vinyl record, it's done. That's static. But they could they could manipulate the cassettes if they weren't satisfied with it. They could update it. They could make improvements. They could erase it or even tape over it. Um, people got into all kinds of interesting technical gymnastics, especially for like collage and cut up type works. There was a lot of collaborating that was going on too. So in this era, companies like TIAC and Fostex were manufacturing uh, affordably for home use these four track porta studios. They were just little small recording studios and they had multiple tracks. Uh, I give an example of an artist in the US was collaborating with an artist in England and they traded tapes back and forth, adding, manipulating, improving. And when they were done, they each released their own mix. I listened to them side by side. It was fascinating. I mean, they were different enough to be really, really interesting, which uh, raises a whole other topic uh, to be a, that you can talk about, like what constitutes a finished product. You know, I mean, there was there there could be no end to it. Um, compilation tapes were big throughout the eighties. There were probably thousands of compilation tapes released, and. That was another thing I talked to a lot of people who they they contributed to as many compilations as they could um, because it was a way to get your get your work heard, but it was also a way to grow your network. I give a quick example here. This is a compilation tape from 1988, and this is representative. It came with a book, and each page of the book was information and artsy stuff about each of the artists. 
but crucially, it also had an address. Um, labels. So a lot of people formed labels. Well, what that really meant in most cases was they had been releasing their own stuff anyway, and they gave it a name. But what would happen was when they got reviewed and it would say, right care of whatever tapes, they'd start hearing from lots of people. Do you want to release my stuff? And I get pretty deep into the labels in the book. Um, people got into it with different levels of uh, attention to being businesslike. Some people got so, so involved uh, that it ended up being to their <laughs> emotional and financial detriment. Um, but they, they made impressive efforts. Uh, radio, I get a little into radio. Um, radio promotion in most cases ended up being somebody who was understood the network, this network and had a show at a, you know, a, college radio station or a public radio station. And I saw ads at various times for cassette only shows. Send it, send me your cassettes and I'll play your cassettes. It was a big, it was, it was a real, it was a real challenge getting DJs to play people's cassettes. It was a bigger hassle to do it at the radio station than to play vinyl. Creative packaging. This is where the 80s cassette culture most intersected with mail art. I give all kinds of accounts of all kinds of wildly creative and sometimes downright wacky ways that people package their cassettes. Um, one example, uh, I could go on and on, but I'll just give one example where a guy got a cassette and it was encased in a melted vinyl LP. <laughs> he had to break the LP to get to the cassette. And another common one way to package them was almost like fluxus boxes where they'd come with all kinds of ephemera, whether it's puzzle pieces and rubber stamps and all kinds of little doodads accompanying the cassette tape. And then finally, I get into what kinds of music and audio art were people uh, creating without any concern, well, there was no record contracts involved, without any concern for uh, sales, People were free to really let their creative juices flow. And they and they did. I mean, sure, there was a lot of mediocrity, but there were wildly diverse forms of rock, jazz, punk, industrial songs, and experimental music that was created throughout the 80s through the early 90s. And uh uh some of it was heard, some of it was heard by very, very few people. The last part of my book, I take three case studies of three different labels in different countries. And uh, and I chose them because they they were international in their scope of the artists that they featured. And I uh, and I just went through and I did reviews of various tapes in their catalogs just to give a feel of of this diversity. So yeah, Rob, I'll stop there. All right. Well thank you. This is really a pleasure to be be here and I really appreciate the uh, the series hosting us. I've enjoyed the series so much. So I'm just, I'm going to read because I'm a reader. So uh, I'll start by reading the opening two paragraphs, which offer vignettes from 1982 and 2009 that roughly define the book's parameters. And then I'm just going to give a quick overview of the book. In 1982, the U.S. record industry was in the throes of one of its periodic bouts of technologically induced panic. Sales of long playing discs were declining for a fourth consecutive year, outpaced for the first time by sales of pre-recorded cassettes, a format the major labels regarded with deep suspicion. A host of factors were at play in the disc's downturn, most notably the 1979 introduction of the Sony Walkman, which along with the cassette's displacement of the 8-track cartridge and car stereo systems, introduced young music fans to a more mobile mode of listening. Yet the major record labels focused their blame on one bugaboo, their own listeners' private duplication of records via blank cassettes as they lobbied for a federal law that would have saddled the fledgling format 
with copyright royalties on sales of all blank tapes and tape recorders, the majors set out to frame the cassette itself as a symbol of rampant piracy. The various industry trade organizations formed an ad hoc umbrella group, hyperbolically dubbed the Coalition to Save America's Music, which issued a series of reports and press releases pushing for the royalty legislation. Full page ads were taken out in newspapers and trade journals and mass mailings of slick brochures were sent to his constituents of key legislators. Yet the most indelible symbol of the era was an image slapped on record sleeves by the British Phonographic Institute that made its way into the collective consciousness of US music fans via imported LPs of second British invasion new wave bands, a Jolly Roger, with a cassette-shaped skull, the eyes of its inner reels staring blankly, headed by the caption, home taping is killing music. In 2009, the total number of pre-recorded cassettes sold in the United States fell to 34,000, barely registering on industry charts against the resurgent LP, let alone against the growing array of digital formats. The cassette's fate appeared sealed with the rollout late that year of the 2010's Lexus SC430, the last new car model to come factory equipped with a cassette player. Yet even on the verge of obsolescence, the cassette was enjoying as busy a symbolic career as Cobain or Presley, its likeness popping up on t-shirts, coffee mugs, mouse pads, tote bags, belt buckles, business cards, and inevitably iPod cases. In short, everywhere but the tape deck. Among a cohort of music fans who came of age in the 80s and 90s, the simple image of a blind cassette rose to the status of a cultural icon, conjuring collective memories of all the music made and shared with the aid of the little plastic cartridge that was supposed to have killed music. For such fans, the cassette's legacy was defined in no small part by its killer app, the mixtape, that homegrown collection of secondhand recordings around which developed a full-blown etiquette of expression and courtship. Having been functionally superseded by mix CDs and iTunes playlists by the mid-2000s, the mixtape shed its mortal coil of oxide-coated plastic and entered the ether of pure discourse. It was name-checked in pop songs and art exhibits, featured countless films and television shows, celebrated by pulp novelists and acclaimed bell letterists. Guggenheim fellow Lucy Santi memorialized it as, quote, a paradigmatic form of popular expression. Library of America editor Jeffrey O'Brien dubbed it, quote, the most widely practiced American art form. Yet the most indelible symbol of that era was the hallmark stock image of a cassette unspooling into heart-shaped ribbons headed by the caption, love is a mixtape. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly give a little bit more of an overview. Uh, while there's a lot of music unspooled, it's chiefly the study of a music format, its affordances, and its public life. James Carey, noted communication scholar, notes that Technologies are often the central actors in our social dramas, the gods and devils. As an account of how the cassette evolved from a symbol of theft to one of love, the book adopts a grammar in which the format functions, the cassette functions, as subject as often as object. It offers a biography of the cassette within a certain milieu, not just a story of a music format, but a story of stories about it. Some of those stories were direful, like those of music industry lobbyists who framed the cassette as a threat to recorded music's very existence. Some stories were redemptive, like those of musicians who put the cassette to work as an instrument of distribution and a symbol of creative plenitude. Some stories were romantic, like those in which a motley collection of songs collected on tape and gifted to another, served as an inalienable expression of affection. And some cassette stories were more ambivalent. Though the cassette made available new worlds of neglected music, 
gatekeepers often twisted themselves in knots, celebrating the format's radical accessibility while trying to filter its oral overload. And although the cassette release served as a stepping stone for countless artists, it never shook its reputation as a lo-fi bridesmaid to the big time formats of vinyl and CD. Even today, the cassette continues to shape shift in public memory, generating new stories of revival and resistance to digital glut. So that's, that's all I'll say for now, and I'll turn it back to Tom. Well, thank you. Uh, those are wonderful introductions to your work and uh, certainly, uh, you know, piqued my interest in it. Uh, you know, uh, talking about piracy it immediately brought to mind uh, the uh, Bow Wow Wow, Your Cassette Pet, right, which was released with a blank side, okay? Um, one of the things that I'm, I'm really struck by is uh, the generosity of people uh, involved in uh, cassette networks, uh, production, et cetera, and... Um, uh, I was, you know, I was thinking about this. One of the things I remember reading about was uh, cassette chain letters where somebody would take like a C90 cassette and put five minutes of material on it and then send it to somebody else who would then add five minutes and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you know, copying it the whole time. And I wonder what the results might have been like, you know, with the uh, generation loss, right, with each successive <laughs> iteration of it, if you ended up with something like that, uh, that Bill Morrison film, Decazia, right, where he got all this nitrate stock, and <laughs> you know, all this disintegrating footage. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's just such a wonderful, uh, rich topic. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about Simon Frith's article, Art Versus Technology, The Strange Case of Popular Music, and how he talks about that, he, he describes how the most successful technological innovations are those that decentralize control. And this really seems to, you know, be a central part of all of your work, right? How uh, people could produce their own work. And uh, so, yeah, I wonder if you could take, if you could each address, you know, cassettes centrality to uh, DIY, do-it-yourself uh, culture. Uh, why, you know, why the cassette? I'll, I'll start. So, yeah, so I do include uh, a section on, you know, the birth of punk in, punk in England. I mean, punk happened on both sides of the, uh, Atlantic, but I get pretty heavily into the UK side and, and DIY and cassettes got real, got real big, but, and it was DIY, but it was kind of in a different way. The, you know, England is much smaller than the US, but they had these weekly newspapers like sound, sound, uh, Sounds and Melody Maker and New Musical Express. And there was a short period where they were reviewing uh just home taper home taper cassettes but it, it it didn't it wasn't what became the network of exchange uh that i wrote about it, it a lot of people a lot of english people who lived during that time will insist that cassette culture in england or that flavor of it died around 1980 and then this the network of exchange and recording at home kind of kind of arose after after night after 1980 and that's and that makes sense and that made sense with my research cuz like I, I think the first issue of op was in early 1981 i believe um but but yeah from from there on uh, it was a lot of people talked about the democ that I interviewed talked about the de democratizing role of the cassette. They didn't have to. They didn't have to worry about uh, record companies. Again, you know, there are still barriers to entry because they could only reach so many people. But then again, the whole idea was just to create. You know, anybody can be an artist, and that's the whole. That's where you get into the. Uh, uh, like Dada and Fluxus and mail art too. The whole heart and soul of it is is just as the cassette culture people issued the record companies, Dada, Fluxus, and mail art 
you know, as you the uh, uh, gallery system. So it's all about anybody. Anybody can be a anybody can be an artist. Um, I was also wondering about uh, live taping and tape trading, right? For specific artists, it seems like a kind of pressing form of uh, viral marketing. And, uh, you know, if you had nothing to offer, right, how would you get involved in this? I mean, I remember drawing from the dim recesses of memory, uh, the whole blanks and postage thing, right? Going on Usenet, for example, and uh, the group Rec Music Bootleg, and somebody would tape a concert and make an offer for uh, blanks and postage, right? You send me blanks and uh, and some money for postage, and I'll copy them and send them to you. Um, you know, uh, I was wondering, to what extent does that still exist? Oh, okay. Uh, I would like I would like to say some something. Just turning back, I think this the the question of live taping and Grateful Dead subculture is fantastic. But just to take up the DIY question that that Tom mentioned and that Jerry elaborated on for a moment, because I think it's it's really impressive the generosity of this subculture that that Jerry is 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 emphasizing and the pro prolif prolificity or prolificness of this culture. Steve, I think or Stevie Moore mentions in one article he had about 180 tapes in print in 1987. So that's all really fascinating. Um, I would love to hear what others have to say about to what degree um cassette artists were DIY because they wanted to be or because at some level they had to be. I think of Martin Newell, who is my favorite cassette artist and who, you know, if you listen to his tapes, of course, his early 80s tapes, he sounds, I mean, he could be, he, he's in the mode of Robin Hitchcock or maybe XTC, kind of a post, post Kinks rock. I love all those tapes, but he was, um, he hated studios. He hated managers and producers. He 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 buying it. Hear me, all right. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yeah. yeah. I, Sorry, yeah. I, I I was getting a message for my. Anyways, Martin Newell. Uh, Recorded as cleaners from, from Venus, by the way, suffered panic attacks at the thought of touring. So at some level, he had to be DIY. Um, he couldn't have had it any other way. He worked as a dishwasher the entire time. He was recording in his hometown and home, home counties outside London. So I no wonder, you know, to what degree the cassette was a, 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 a a, a format of refuge, to what degree was it a format of exile, to what degree uh, cassette artists had to be cassette artists versus wanting to be, things like that. Yeah, I, mean, I think a cool a cool thing about that is that even though they are two separate issues a little bit, they blur together pretty quickly. Like Daniel Johnston, sort of the, the biggest, most famous example of a lo-fi cassette artist, wanted to be the Beatles. I mean, if yeah. somebody had come to his house and said record in the studio right away, he would have done it. But as soon as he realized he had to do cassettes, he took advantage of them completely and and did things with them that he wouldn't have been able to do in studios. No one would have tolerated it. And, mm. and, and you know, and I think his music was affected completely by the fact that he was doing it on cassette and he took advantage of it and sort of thrived with it. And I think that happened with a lot of people, even if they had they weren't necessarily thinking, I want to be an obscure artist. Or I want to just make my music on cassettes. When when they figured out they had to, they they immediately saw things in it that were really valuable for the kind of art they were making. Yeah, I'll add to that. There was, I, I found a lot of variation. There was a lot of people who were, who were just dedicated to DIY and they didn't care all they, if, if all they interacted with was fellow home tapers, that was, that was just fine to them. Others, because of the type of music and audio art they were doing, accepted 
that that was going to be the case. Um, but there were others that really wanted to take a shot. There was a guy, uh, I never knew how to pronounce his last name, Andrew Savitz Kovats uh, in, in uh, uh, Massachusetts. But he released, and it was a cooperative thing. Everybody put their money together that wanted to participate. He was determined to get vinyl releases out because that was the way you had to be heard. And uh, he put out these grindstone compilations. There was three LPs and then a, uh, a CD. But that's an example of somebody who he was wildly pro prolific to all kinds of really interesting electronica. But uh, he, he was determined to take a shot at trying to get some exposure. It only went so far, but uh, just on that topic, he just had different attitudes. Mm -hmm. I didn't talk to anybody though I should say that had any expectation whatsoever of making it, getting a recording contract or anything. So I talked to nobody that had those expectations. Um, have, uh, are, are cassettes still a primary medium of exchange for DIY culture or have they been supplanted or replaced by CDRs to any significant extent, would you say? Uh, the people I enter, the people I'll, I'll just say real quick. The people I interact with that are hold out, that still plug away and who are around in the eighties, uh, some of them have done cassettes. Very few of them, though. In fact, uh, very few of them do CDRs anymore. Most of the ones that I continue to communicate with have gone mostly digital. You know, some get an opportunity with a small label and do a CD release or a vinyl release if they have an opportunity. But most of the ones I talk to have gone digital now. Yeah, I mean, there was definitely a point, at least in, in the noise music I was following, where CDRs took over for a while. And CDRs were the way that noise bands sold their music at shows and things like that. Now, basically, the the to me, the most interesting use of cassettes is independent labels that are actually manufacturing them. that send them to a, their records, you know, their music to a plant and get them to make official manufactured tapes and sell them that way as, instead of selling vinyl or CDs. That's really what most of the people who are younger than me, which is a wide range, <laughs> uh, are, are doing with cassettes is manufacturing as opposed to dubbing their own music onto single copies and selling them that way. And so many of those tapes you you review in, yeah. uh, in Pitchfork and in in uh, yeah. other venues are beautiful. I made, I made one too, if anyone's interested. <laughs> Get to go with the books. Yeah. yeah. But those manufactured tapes are, are beautiful. The the, mm -hmm. the uh, packaging, the J cards, and yeah. you know, it's not a scribbled thing like or roughly co photocopied thing like it was in the yeah. old days of cassette culture. Oh, yeah. I definitely think that the art on independent label cassettes is much more interesting uh, thing going on right now than with with vinyl art. I mean, a lot of people do good vinyl art too, but there's so many creative, interesting labels doing weird and uh, sort of innovative artwork, in, uh, both in the context of individual releases, but also many of these labels kind of stamp the art with a kind of format that you can recognize it's from that label, and yet they're still able to get into each individual release to have a distinct look too. It's pretty awesome. Hmm. No, I guess uh, uh, given the preponderance of digital uh, distribution these days, it seems like there's really something lost in this process, though, because it's hard to develop an emotional attachment to a thumbnail, you know, whereas when you have a physical artifact, right, you have that haptic sensation of holding the thing and looking at it and, you know, pouring over the notes, et cetera. And... Uh, I guess, you know, is this uh, has, is the matter of convenience uh, for distribution, et cetera, does that, is that more important than, I guess, laboring over the packaging of it or, or what have you, you know, what is, is there something lost in this process? Uh, well, it's, it's certainly not the same. Uh, again, I'm kind of speaking on behalf of people that 
I still interact with who did this back in the eighties. And, and again, I'm just speaking to the people that sub that subset, but their concern is just finding others to collaborate with. And uh, like, like one guy is doing a let's trade Bandcamp download codes, and that's his way of that's Hal McGee I'm talking about Rob. Uh, mm. He does a let let's do uh, let's trade Bandcamp download codes, and that's kind of a way he's trying to maybe that maybe that for him that's his way of re reliving the uh, the old days. I think the sort of interesting irony of a lot of cassette labels now that I write about and and talk to and trade tapes with and stuff is that. Part of their motivation for getting into cassettes is uh, as a reaction to digital streaming and and algorithms and playlists and things like that. They you know they they find that not satisfying and soulless in weird ways and and so they turn to cassettes as kind of you know partially just because they're cheaper and easier and faster to make and they can sell them at shows, but also as a statement of like we're rejecting where music is going when it in terms of streaming and the way it's devaluing it and the way it's sort of flattening it all. Like you say, there's just a small thumbnail. And like, if I make a playlist, it looks like anybody else's playlist. It just has different words on it and things like that. So I, I'm not 100% sure how many of these labels would have been as gung-ho about getting into tapes if they hadn't seen what was sort of happening to music in the streaming era. Right. And uh, I think, you know, Rob, you talk, you've talked about this, uh, the mixtape, right? How it continues to have this kind of resonance because... Mm -hmm. The process of making a mixtape for somebody is a real time process. You know, it's not a matter of grabbing, grabbing and dropping files. You have to queue everything up, right? You have to uh, make sure that uh, the segues work out properly, and then uh, you know, there's creating the cover for the thing. I remember uh, how delighted I was back in the late seventies to discover press type, so I didn't have to subject. <laughs> my illegible scrawl mm -hmm. right um and so that still has such you know has such meaning you know that people even if they've virtually gone all digital they probably still retain their mixtapes right as souvenirs yeah um there's an irony i think in the fact that another and mark talks very uh extensively about this revival as he said uh, in cassette releases there's no real revival in mixtaping people aren't making mixtapes anymore that i know of nobody's giving them to me anymore at least uh, people make playlists and yet the mixtape the idea of the mixtape haunts a lot of you know playlist making and all sorts of digital collections people are always saying spotify is saying oh look I, we discover weekly it's like getting a mixtape from us every week or something like that you see dozens of these quotes and i think there's a real kind of pining pining for that that labor of love that the, that that the mixtape was i didn't get to talk about the beginnings of my project i really did start interviewing people about mixtapes about the mid knots about 2005 or so and that's when just the, the people were just over the mixtapes and moving on to mix cds and i could almost see in slow motion or hear in slow motion in these interviews the way that the mix cd moved very quickly from kind of like a tape with a, a thing with a meaning and with a fidelity that wasn't supposed to be broken up or disaggregated to just the kind of temporary host to get music from one person's hard drive to another and you could just pick and choose and add it to your library and listen to what you want so i think we pine for the sense of the captive audience right the sense of captive listeners and the sense of closing off not just all other music but all other people except for me and you who are sharing this sharing this mix I uh, I see that we're rapidly approaching the time for uh, Q and A, but I do want to uh, go back very briefly to uh, the subject of uh, live taping and tape trading, uh, because I re I remember how important it was to track generations, right? And so you kept trying to get closer and closer to that first generation, right? The original <laughs> artifact, the recording itself. 
uh, because of uh, generation loss, et cetera. And, uh, you know, there's a, there are many accounts of the difficulties of, uh, of recording live shows. I was wondering if more and more artists are realizing that this kind of thing does serve as an effective form of viral marketing. And if, I, I also think some artists at their shows are offering uh, CDRs of the show, right? As soon as the show's over, they burn the thing and make it available for sale. And if that is any kind of a revenue stream or if that's still any kind of a, a, a real specialized sort of item. Yeah, not that I know. I do remember bands doing that maybe 10 to 15 years ago. That was, and clubs even were starting to market that a little bit, that idea that your ticket included a CDR at the end of the show. But I haven't heard that much about that recently. I'm not sure that anybody's doing that much anymore. I, 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 I'm relatively clueless about if any touring acts, especially on the larger size, are encouraging bootlegging or or you know file trading or anything like that i'm not really sure i mean sure, certainly the the acts associated with that with that before like fish and dead and company are probably still doing it but i i don't know if anybody else is i not something i know about unfortunately okay since we're on the topic of live taping i would like to put in a, a plug for a book that recently came out on duke uh, live dead uh, by John Brackett, which looks at the evolution of the, the Grateful Dead's recorded live sound and how it worked in kind of tandem or interaction with the tape traders. And so how they moved from all the overdubs on their early live records like Live Dead in Europe 72, more towards something like Dick's Picks that sounded a lot like, like an audience tape. And if I could, just as long as I have your attention, in addition to John's book, there's two other books I need to mention because this is a renaissance we're experiencing in, in research about formats and about cassettes in particular. Andrew Simon's book, Media for the Masses, which has already been mentioned, is a, it's a study of cassettes in Egypt. It's as good a study of cassettes in a single country as any since uh, Peter Manuel's uh, cassette culture back in 1992 just study and I couldn't help seeing in the in the comments there Ben Duster is here and he has been writing wonderful articles he is totally focused on the post-millennial cassette labels and he's done interviews in he'll correct me if I'm wrong I think Australia and Japan and the U.S. and um, he's promising I just saw it on Instagram today a book entitled Tomorrow on Cassette I think coming up out from Bloomsbury soon. So it's just a great time to be studying cassettes, if I might say. Um, digital audio tape was supposed to be the successor to uh, uh, analog cassettes. What happened with that? It doesn't seem to have really caught on in any kind of a consumer format. Well, I the... never knew about that from bands I knew using it. I I knew of nobody using it just for home use. Not that I knew of. Yeah, That's I only ever heard of it as a studio, it. studio format, really. The Home Recording Act of 1992 uh, levied, levied the royalties on DATs, any digital format and any digital player, and also mandated uh, copy protection so that killed the DAT. In fact, it was intended to kill all digital formats. MP3 just came about because it got hacked into an open format. And um, also Apple label, it's just very interesting, Apple labeled for an exception to that 92, 1992 law. And that's why we ended up with, with uh, CD burners and things like that. I'm trying to think of the I think it's Appetite for Destruction. I can't remember the author's book, the author's name, but it's a fantastic account of what happened at DAT, but also um, the way that digital formats uh, uh, evolved beyond that. Yeah. 
Okay, uh, before we turn it over to uh, Q and A, I was wondering what are uh, some of the if you could each talk about some of the uh, challenges you encountered and some of the biggest surprises you found in the course of your research and writing. Uh, I'll start. Uh, challenges, I guess it's interesting. Uh, I wish I, I I interviewed a lot of people and I tried to interview people around the world, but there was a lot of people I wish I could have found or made contact with that I didn't. But since I finished my research in 2017, a lot of people that I would have liked to have contacted showed up have showed up on on Facebook and are and are accessible now. So that's about the one challenge I could think of. Uh the biggest surprise is the number of people that go back to the early 80s that are still enthusiastically active. Uh and and some and and I know some people that were coached back into it that had been effectively retired. And somebody who had been an old contact back in the day found them on Facebook or whatever and uh, inspired them to get, become active again. I I didn't have any challenges. Mine was super smooth. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I guess probably Rob might have encountered this too. Some of the the more interesting things about cassettes were very much on a personal level, like personal mixtapes and the tape trading, bootleg trading, and so. It's sort of how do you tell that story? There's not famous mixtape makers. Mm. There were some famous bootleggers, sort of, but not a ton of them. So uh, sort of automatically you have to tell it through individual stories and hope that those are representing enough of what you want to say about the, those phenomenon. So that's a challenge, but it's also kind of cool because everybody who writes about this subject is going to have a different stories that they can tell along that line. So it was both a challenge and a cool part of it. Um, for me, the biggest surprise, I guess, was um, I grew up in the D.C. area and I knew about go-go music and I had no clue that it was so tied to cassettes. Um, there were there were stores you could go to in D.C. I was too young to know about this, but you could go to a store and say, I want to hear a Trouble Funk concert from last month and a Experience Unlimited concert from a year ago on one cassette and they'd dub it for you and they'd have a book full of them that you could get any kind of show you wanted and I just did that was a big surprise to me it's really cool because that music was kind of a form of communication in DC uh, the bands were talking about things to the audiences and back and forth to each other it was kind of like their news network and the tapes definitely accelerated that like you know like crazy I think my uh, biggest surprise was learning and I think David Novak's uh, book Japanese was the one that really alerted me to it that cassettes never went away in some circles. It wasn't as if they died and then experienced a revival within certain communities, particularly international noise scene. They were always the format of choice. And uh, as far as the challenge, the biggest challenge has been, is this, talking about it, because I'm much more comfortable uh, writing than I am talking about my work. And frankly, in a setting like this, even recalling what I wrote last year is a little bit of a task because I write, I don't know how others feel about this, but I write so I can stop th thinking about things. They obsess me and they're like earworms until I finally write it down. I want to move on to something else, but that's not the way the world works. So here I am. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, let's see, Carl, you've been tracking the uh, questions that have been coming in. Would you like to? Uh... Yeah, I think we can turn to that now. Thanks so much, everybody. This has been great so far. This we really could. I have a hundred questions, so I'm doing it, but we've got lots coming in in the chat. Um, the first one, I'll just get out of the way. I don't think we need to go to Ben to ask this, but Ben, I was asking of Jerry um, whether the hard copy of Cassette Culture is still in print. They're saying that the only the ebook version looks readily for sale. Yeah, the hardback is sold out. It it's a long story, but the publisher uh, does small does small runs, and it's sold out. So only the ebook is available now. Okay, great. Thanks for clearing that up. Um, and now a, a, a more <laughs> further reaching question from um, Ben Duster. Do you want to um, do you want to um, unmute and ask your question? 
Sure. Um, sorry, I'm just coming off of COVID, so I sound absolutely stunning. Um, my question is about uh, Robin James's Cassette Mythos, uh, which is this compilation of um, interviews and like zine articles it did. He compiled that in 92, so somewhat of the tail end of like maybe the 1980s cassette culture. And um, just personally speaking, that zine or like that book was one of the only ones I could find when I was starting my research back in like 2014. Um, so I was curious to hear if that was on your radar, how much of a resource it was, and maybe if you have talked to Robin about the project in person. Thank you. Uh, it was definitely on my radar. In fact, I I I got to know Robin pretty well, and for uh, he lived here in Columbus, Ohio, for a while, and I was even the he 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 didn't have he was on the move and living a gypsy life, and I was got to be the caretaker of his entire cassette collection for a while. Uh, I go on about the kid in, kid in the candy shop experience that was. But yeah, when I started doing my research, as far as I could tell, that was the only book that had uh, addressed this homemade music cassette culture network that I wrote about. And in fact, you said it was written, it published in 92. What's important to know about that is all those essays in there were written in the late 80s when this whole thing was actually going on. So yes, it was published at the tail end of it, but those, uh, but the uh, the essays were written some years earlier. Yeah, I, I love that book. It was a great source to use. I, I interviewed Robin as well for mine and and some other people who had written essays in it. And yeah, it's it's excellent. And and it's it's cool that it's sort of just essays. It's not an overarching narrative. Although he and Hal both have times in there where they try to make bigger points about the whole cassette culture scene. Um, the interesting thing is, so um, Jerry just uh, referenced uh, uh, Robin's tape collection. Robin eventually sold a lot of his tape collection to uh, Jed Bindeman, who's in my book as well, who's sort of a tape hunter himself and has this great Instagram called Concentric Circles, where he, po he whenever he finds a rare tape or a tape that not necessarily rare, but just no one knows about, he'll post it and write about it and, and uh, include an audio clip. And uh, so he's probably the best possible person to have Robin's collection of tapes. Great. Um... Next up, um, Chris Malanfi. Chris, do you want to ask your question? Hey, guys. Uh, great to hear from all of you. Um, so this is a bit of a wacky theory, but I threw it out there about a decade ago. At PopCon 2014, I offered the theory that the peak of the cassette, which in terms of pre-recorded cassettes sold by the industry, was 1983 to 1991. It coincided with the peak of the period where we scored the most hit singles from an album. I'm talking the year, era of... Thriller, Born in the USA, Control, Hysteria, Faith, Rhythm Nation, et cetera, et cetera. And my thesis was that when our primary medium was hard to skip around, because of course, uh, fast forward and rewind buttons were murder uh, on Walkman batteries, uh, the industry wanted to milk albums for radio and chart singles so you wouldn't have to fast forward very far to find a hit. A CD era, by contrast, was the era of the single hit album where you could like milk a single song for a whole a platinum album. Uh, because it was easier to zap to your favorite song. Does this sound plausible to you guys? And to widen it out, are there other ways you turned up where, where cassette technology shaped pop content and promotion? Because I think there are his, examples throughout history right down to the three minute length of the pop single that have to do with technology and media. So and any comments are welcome. That's fascinating. Um... Uh, it needs to be written up. Um, I had just thought about, because you're talking about the cassette's affordances or its technological constraints, and I've always thought of those as limiting conditions, and I think they were at least written about or talked about very often as limiting conditions. The record industry disliked cassettes. They wanted to move as quickly as possible from vinyl to CDs, partly because they were copyable, that's most famously, but also because not only were they kind of lo-fi, kind of uh, uh, low uh, uh, fidelity, but also they were hard to skip around, like you say, they had to be rewound, and also they were hard to produce. 
vinyl records could be produced in one pressing. Interesting. Because that tape has to be produced inch by inch. And there are stories, of course, at that peak that you're talking about where they would have to produce, they were producing tapes because they're making millions of Michael Jackson or whatever tapes, and they're doing it at 64 speed. And naturally, you, use, you lose some fidelity. And they also put them in terrible housings. I mean, if you compare a, a Maxell 2S housing from that time to you know a, a store-bought pre-recorded mass-targeted tape. So I've always thought of that as something that the record industry wanted to get past those things about tape. But it's a very interesting theory that, yeah, people were cap much more captive audiences about tape. I mean, uh, uh, Adam Harvitz of Beastie Boys talks in the Beastie Boys book about spending hours and hours of his youth just fast forwarding and rewinding tapes. And I think that's the experience of a lot of us. Yeah. Now I, I parceled out battery time. Uh, very, very carefully in the 80s. I'm sorry, please continue. No, I'm done, yeah. I, I was just going to say, I, one thing I, am I muted? No, I'm not. Um, I love the, the commitment aspect of tapes compared to the CD skipping around and the vinyl skipping around, I think is one of the best things. That, and certainly a lot of the music I grew up listening to, and especially indie music, was about like subjecting you to the entire tape and and kind of collaging the music together and thinking of it as one, you know, aside being one long track in a weird way. And I also, I also wonder if like, I haven't ever read about this, but I wonder the whole concept of CD bonus tracks and stuff really originated more with tapes first, I think. I mean, a lot of the yes. tapes I really remember about like the, the Cure singles tape that had, you know, nothing but B-sides and rarities on the other side, I, I, that always felt like a special thing. As far back as the police's synchronicity, Murder by Numbers was only on the tape version of that. You didn't get it on vinyl, for example. Right, right. Yeah, and then these kind of things too, the two, the two for... Kind of right that too you know yeah um i think that that yes that probably is the first example of like bonus material being something officially available yeah, yeah. david burns record uh, david uh, talking heads records from that early 80s period as well as his the catherine wheel with uh mm. twilight harp those have a lot more material on tape mm -hmm. than they do on vinyl and Byrne talked in interviews about doing that intentionally because he wanted a favorite tape because record companies were so unfairly against it and were so blaming all their problems on the kids' home taping. So he liked tape for those reasons. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks, guys. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, it's funny when you were talking about that. I was thinking of the, like the, the phenomenon of the hidden track, which really could only happen on tape. And it was like a test of some kind of listener worthiness that you would like wait through two minutes of silence for the hidden track to come up. Um, so I have a question next time, sort of moving from Chris's 80s question to a 90s question. There was kind of a mid 90s moment after Nirvana broke and after the kind of major label feeding frenzy on indie culture at the time, where like the new alternative kind of became a development from 80s cassette culture in a way it was this kind of home taping culture I think particularly of like the artists on Shrimper and other labels like that and uh, you know so like Folk Implosion and Guided by Voices and the Mountain Goats and Smog this kind of lo-fi movement that in some ways like encoded a paucity of recording technology into the aesthetic of it and I, I was curious both what parts of the cassette culture ethos were honored by that and and what were sacrificed and similarly like what effect that had on the more under underground cassette network when suddenly there were people kind of breaking through you know and you mentioned daniel johnson earlier as another example so i'm just uh, curious of thinking about that moment in cassette culture's life Yeah, that, I talk at some length about shrimper and lo-fi, and there's a lot to say there. I mean, the first thing is, I mean, compared to the stuff that Jerry's talking about, uh, shrimper got so much more attention from the mainstream rock press, uh, you know, which zines like Option by then are mainstream. So there's a lot of art. And I think just the curiosity of working bands like like the mountain goats or, or you know, 
Ubarlo or various hacks, Sabado from uh, Centrado slash Centrado. Um, going to cassette as a medium of choice was confusing to people and they wanted to know why. And it was sort of homologous with the with the lo-fi sound. Um, I think by then, at least for certain people, certain John Darnell, or, I never interviewed him, but from what I read, and he could speak to it more than, certainly more than I did, but I think it became a, a more of a symbol, less of a practical thing at some point, and more of a, a symbolic gesture, you know, sticking with tape and sticking with this lo-fi uh, uh, format precisely because of the connotations it had, it had gained over 10, 15 years of use. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting how cassettes, the sound of cassettes kind of dovetailed with the whole 80s and 90s idea that it's selling out to go to a major label. It's also selling out to sound better than a cassette in a, in a way. And mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I one thing I never really thought about until I wrote the book and really after the book, because I didn't mention it that much in the book, is that this weird way the cassette sort of flipped authenticity, at least in indie scenes. Because if you think of technically the idea of authenticity is the most authentic recording is the one that sounds the most like what's being played, right? So in a studio, you're getting more of a direct signal from the instrument straight to the tape. In in a uh, when you're recording on a four track or a boombox, you're getting a lot of stuff in between hiss and decay and weird stuff. But that sounds more authentic because there's less people in between you and the artist, even though there's more noise in between you and the artist. But there's nobody sort of gatekeeping that music or telling the artist how how they should record. Generally, there aren't. So a, a hissy tape actually weirdly sounds more authentic than a high fidelity recording. Yeah, well, and it, it kind of fetishizes a certain kind of amateurism, even if that amateurism is is a bit of a pretense, right? <laughs> right, right, <laughs> totally. Jerry, just following up on that for a sec, did, was there any sense of that being a moment when, you know, the that the culture had gone overground, and was was there any sense of betrayal in that kind of sense of oh now everybody's talking about homemade cassettes or whatever? Yeah, not with not with the not with the subculture of people I was wrote about and interacted with. I learned, to be honest, I learned more about the labels you guys are talking about from Mark and Rob's books than I than I ever knew before. Now, the people I wrote about, they either took a step back or they just moved on. Uh, as some as as one guy said, uh, the cassette never died; it just moved on to the next format. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Antonia, yours was a comment, but I wonder if there's a way to make it into a question because I feel like the question of hip hop DJ mixtapes is a thing that we should be addressing in this session. Um, sure. I mean, I think the the question underneath that is um something about the genres that are made possible by cassette culture and um DJ uh, mixtapes. Um, where the person's whole career is making mixtapes, DJ drama, but K Slay and DJ um, Clue, all these hip hop artists who make mixtapes, but then um, people uh, uh, more recent generations don't know what a tape is. And so I don't know if that same sort of music can be made because that the format has gone away. So is there a way that the decline in mix of cassette tapes takes away certain sorts of some sort of genres of music. Yeah, I, I think that's pretty possible. Yeah. Um I mean I think it's really cool. It's interesting and cool that that uh hip hop mixtapes are still called mixtapes even when they're on the C D or on digital, whatever. It shows that the cachet the cassette had that, that uh, something more direct and more sort of independent. But um it's interesting you mentioned GJ Clue. I mean from what I researched and wrote about he was kind of a turning point in which mixtape hip hop mixtapes became about having the most recent tracks. They were like playlists, like like the uh, he would he would be able to get early on a studio recording of something that hadn't come out yet and put them on his mixtape. And he was that's what purpose his served. Whereas early DJ mixtapes were really about the art of DJing. I mean, the music on there was important, but it was the break beats and the mixing. And that, and that's what people wanted to hear. Some people had heard the music before. They wanted to hear what Grandmaster Flash or Brucey B or whatever could do with the different songs and could how he could mix them and break them together. And and the other DJs wanted to hear that too because the styles were. I think I have someone quoted in my book who said like 
your when mixtapes were really going around, if you came up with something new in your set, it would be in someone else's set within a couple days, usually. So I think that was that kind of thing went away even before tapes went away when it became more about just previewing new music. That moment of uh, DJ Clue, though, is fascinating in the sense that, that he becomes such a gatekeeper, as you say. And I have a story where he uh, included uh, Notorious B.I.G.'s Hypnotized on one of his tapes before it was released. And one of the New York program directors of the hip hop stations was so pissed off that he bought a copy off the street and started playing it on the radio along with DJ Clue's, you know, little inter little spiels are in there, but it was the only copy you could get. He's not this guy's not gonna scoop me. <laughs> yeah, I think about um the idea of Raycon's purple tape, the first pressing of Raycon's only you only built for Cuban links, the tape version is Revere, the purple tape. So yeah, the the rarity of that. Thank you. Yeah, and it you know it's cool. Like it feels like for a long time too. The other thing that DJ mixtapes did was um, you could get put tracks out that you couldn't clear the samples for, and that was a way mm -hmm. to like get those things out. Um, mm -hmm. We have a question from Andrew Simon next. Hi everyone, uh, thanks so much for this brilliant discussion. Uh, I enjoyed it immensely. Uh, returning to your opening remarks, Rob, I must admit that. The case of my iPhone is a cassette. This is something <laughs> that I purchased off of Amazon after I saw it on the HBO show Rap Shit, which came out two years ago um, and is part of this cassette revival that you were discussing. Um, I have two quick questions um, for everyone. I'm curious what you all see as being the cassette's future and what you make of recent efforts to preserve and popularize cassette recordings really from around the world in digital archives. Um, Syrian cassette archives, a number of other initiatives come to mind. And then is there a story uh, about cassette culture that didn't surface in your respective books uh, that you wish could have been included? Thanks so much. Uh, I'll start by mentioning you. You said one thing, Andrew, that prompted me to think about. So the so the company that published my the hardback version of my book, they started as a reissue label doing these elaborate vinyl box sets of these '80s. Well, they even went. Someone went back to the late '70s. These '80s artists, a lot of whom I wrote about. So this that's how they got. What's that? This is one of them, the vinyl on demand. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Vinyl on demand, right? Um, it's not on vinyl. It's not yeah. on vinyl. Though. As far as the, and I'll just say briefly, as you asked about the future of the cassette, I, uh, I, I I'm going to introduce a little bit of cynicism. You know, when whenever I, you know, many albums I buy these days, and most uh, cassettes I buy, and most cassettes I buy these days. My favorite local record store, the the guy that runs it knows me as the guy who likes weird stuff. And whenever he gets cassettes in by a local or regional label, he'll message me on Facebook and I'll go and buy them. But they invariably include a download code. <laughs> uh, so so I'm I, I didn't I've not talked to the to this this generation and, uh, uh, you, you know, Mark and Rob get a lot more into that than I do, but uh, I, I wonder about the motivation when I see the download code in there. So that's my answer about the future. Now, there's a lot of debate about whether, to what degree, these new tapes get actually listened to as opposed to being, I don't know, to be cynical, to being Instagram father and containers for the download code. Also, in some cases, just a, a nice thing to do if you're at a show and you want something that'll fit in your pocket and you want to help the band, it's just a nice form of, of merch to get. But I think Mark could talk to that more than me, to what degree. I listen to tapes, but I listen mostly, quite honestly, to tapes I have from, from the old days rather than new tapes. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think that there are people who buy cassettes and don't play them and and download use the download code. Uh, but I, I don't think there's ever, I think anything wrong with that. Necessarily. First of all, it's very hard to find decks now as it is. But <laughs> but also, I, I think you know it's it's to support bands. It's to get something um, tangible rather than you know and 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 not to you know just give them a penny per stream or way less than a penny or whatever. And, and I, I think it's become sort of a hybrid object. It symbolizes both something, maybe nostalgic, maybe not, but it also symbolizes continuing to support artists with physical media. We haven't really figured out a way to support an artist well directly through digital media. Buying down, buying MP3s is good, but still, I think physical still does something that that doesn't do. Um, the, the one question you mentioned about cassette culture and stories not being good. I have a couple of those. I mean, I, I kind of wish that I had figured out a way into new age cassettes. I, I I wanted to include that in my chapter about genres that were spawned by cassette. I just, the, the little bit of digging didn't turn up anything that made, made it feel like I had a story there, but I'm sure there is one there. Probably somebody should write a whole book about that eventually. Um, and the great thing about the subject though, is that it does keep, I mean, there were so many people doing it in the eighties and nineties with so many different ways. I mean, I I don't know if you know Linda Smith, the independent artist who was a big cassette person. And I just, unfortunately, I don't know how I missed it. I just recently found out about her. And it, she certainly would have been in the book if I had known about her just a year earlier or something. And and the thing is, that's always that kind of thing's always going to pop up. And it, it, sometimes when you write a book, that's kind of for on a finite thing. That's a little painful to find out somebody you missed. But the great thing with cassettes is there's just always going to be somebody we missed in a good way. That's what makes them so such a rich subject, I think. Say, so Mark, I'm just wondering, based on Andrew's question about digital archiving, the sort of tape, the tape hunters who you talk to, are they involved in digital archiving of some of those collections? Yeah, well, I mean, Mark, I think it's Jurgis or Gurgis who who's involved with Sublime Frequencies has um, the Syrian cassette archives. That he the, the website he's been put up based on all the cassettes he's collected over the years he's slowly digitizing them and putting artwork up and things like that um so that's that's one example i mean in many cases their their way of archiving is putting these label people who are finding them is putting the music out on vinyl <laughs> so that people will buy it and they can reimburse the artists mm -hmm. and things like that so it's not quite the same but that's that's part of what's happening too um, I'm going to jump in here and just try to get one last question in before we go, and that's from Elena Razlagova. Elena, are you still with us? Yep, I'm here. Um, thank you very much for um, wonderful presentations. Um, I'm wondering about specifically the period of late 80s, early 90s, and the relationship between cassette culture and the early internet, and I think about I put two examples in the um, in the chat. There's the, there was this um, uh, early um, site, Internet Underground Music Archive, which was started by rockers who were also tape traders. Then the Grateful Dead, which already came up. But I want to add um, also to my question on the chat. So other examples of synergy that other examples of such synergy um, where people were fans of taping and also fans of the early internet sharing. Or was there resistance to the early internet and tapes were put the kind of presented as an alternative to the rise of uh, internet culture? Uh, I'll say that I end my story precisely at the time you're talking about, you're talking about. And it, it, talking to a lot of people I interviewed, I was even able to mark uh, 1992, not as a hard time, but where a lot of people either seem to just drift away from it. Uh, a lot of people found a whole new generation coming in that didn't seem to have the communal spirit that they had come become accustomed to. And that got them a bit disillusioned and, and they stepped away. But I also deliberately, I'm kind of not directly answering your question, but I, I chose to end my story there because once you get into the internet and more widespread adoption of these, you know, electronic and online services, now you're in a period of technological and cultural change that just seemed like a, a pretty, a pretty good ending point to my story. So uh, again, not, not a direct answer to your question, but you got me thinking about how I concluded my book. 
Rich made a good point in the chat, and, and Jerry knows about this, that a lot of, like Hal McGee and a lot of the other experimental cassette artists, from cassette colors, are putting their music up on Bandcamp and archive.org and things like that. So they're definitely open to the internet in terms of, of it being a tool to spread their music around, you know, just as fast as they could on cassette. I, I think one of the kind of interesting things is, I, I'm not 100% sure how many people from the cassette cultures were uh resistant to the internet versus wanting to jump on it right away but i do i have noticed sort of the younger generation who came up at the point of the early internet found out about tapes that way they often <laughs> like like brian and noah from animal collective got into trading grateful dead tapes because they saw them discussed on online forums so that's a kind of a weird like I said backwards hybrid of that whole thing now i was going to say the first thing that came to mind with your question, and it was, I think, an article I read by you, so that doesn't help at all. Um, just the thought, the idea of people at FMU, which I know you're writing about, uh, being sort of pro um, anticipating online uh, music sharing and sort of offering in some ways some of those DJs and people that you could speak to it more than me uh, as a continuous line from cassette culture to 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 online file sharing. I will also say our moderator, Tom McCord, is the biggest WFMU fan in the world. So he's going to be really <laughs> excited about your work, as you could see from his T-shirt. That's true. Yeah, I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Great. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Um, I just want to thank all of you. Um, this this conversation really could have gone on for another couple of hours, and um, and it's just been a delight. And um, want to remind everybody that next week at the same time next Monday we have um, sort of a sequel or a prequel actually to a discussion of formats and technologies um, with Jeremy Mueller here to talk about his book about the long playing record in jazz with Nate Sloan. Um, so. We hope to see you all again next time.